TikTok, TikTok. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're live. We are live. Yay. Um, hello again, Mia. Hello. Um, so we are live and we are here for a webinar about creating home, um, creating home for our characters in our novels and creating a home for ourselves as writers. And I'm really excited to talk about this topic with Mia. And also, we're excited to receive questions from anyone who's listening live. You know, there'll be people listening afterwards. Um, but we're excited to, uh, to hear what everyone has to ask and, and wants to talk further about. Um, we also want to thank Las Musas for hosting this webinar, providing us a space um, and a community, a collective community, um, for us to also have another, another home. Um, so we're gonna, we are going to do a quick um, introduction of ourselves, um, and then we're gonna talk about why this topic, Mia's gonna give us an introduction as to why we picked this topic, the topic of creating home. Does that sound good, Mia? Yes, excellent. Um, and I just wanted to say, you can say hello and to, uh, tell us where you're from in the chat box. You should be able to write to us. And we've also published a quick poll to see um, if you are a writer, what genre, uh, what age range you're writing in, and if you're not a writer, if you're here as a reader, we also would like to know. Um, so go ahead in the poll section if you if you can fill that out as well. Uh, so I am uh, Mia Garcia, um, and yes, this is a giant Puerto Rican flag right behind me, hiding my <laughs> unmade bed because I did not <laughs> did not have the time. Um, <laughs> Uh, so that's a perfect use uh, for a giant flag. Uh, so I wrote uh, Even If the Sky Falls and The Resolutions, which I'll be talking more about The Resolutions today. Um, the Resolutions is about four uh, Latinx teens, specifically Puerto Rican um, uh, and mixed teens who are doing New Year's resolutions for each other. Um, instead of doing it for themselves, their friends get to write the resolutions for each other. And essentially it follows them through the year that follows as they're trying to complete the resolutions, uh, whether it sort of messes up their lives or opens up new avenues for them. Um, we follow them through all those trials and tribulations and, and make out sessions. And it is a fun book. I really enjoyed um, reading it, Mia. And it also at times made me, I think there was a few times where it made me cry a little. Yes. So, um, all the fields, <laughs> all the fields. Um, so I'm Carmen Rodriguez, and I am the author of The Universal Laws of Marco, and my last book before that was uh, 34 Pieces of You, and not for display right now, because I don't have a copy, is not anything which was my first book. Um, but I'll be talking mostly about, well, really only about Marco today. Um, Marco is the story of a, of a high schooler, a senior, last year of high school, um, and his group of friends. It's only, unlike Mia, which is written from four points of view, this is only written from one point of view, Marco's point of view, um, but it is written in two timelines, the past and the present. Um, and Marco is going through his senior year, uh, getting ready to go away to college. He has a scholarship, but he's also wrestling with a few disruptions in his life. We'll talk about those disruptions um, in relationship to creating home. Um, one being that the first love, has come back into his life and he has a girlfriend, so that's a great conflict for him. Another um, one is around his family and then also some disruptions surrounding his friendship. Um, so yeah, that's my description for now. Um, so why, why home? Yeah. Why, why home? home indeed. When you first asked me to do this uh, um, chat, I was like, yeah, that sounds great. And then like a week later I was like, what, is, what are you even talking? talking about what is home <laughs> what do you mean by home and then like and I kept thinking about it as like well home can mean a lot of things like we can think of the classic hero's journey of finding home or leaving home and home as a place that needs to be uh, gotten to but really when I think of home I think of a lot of times of um finding something within yourself a lot of the times and uh, a character development uh who is our north star when we're going through um our harshest moments who is that home that we continue to come back to that is part of who we are no longer um not just as people but also when you're forming your character who is home for them who is the the building blocks of who they are as um characters and what essentially is going to lead you through a plot is how you have built home uh within your story um, so it has a lot of hats at the same time. So sometimes home can be completely destroyed. Um, we think that it's completely destroyed or, or, or it, it is something that we don't easily identify. So 
there's so much that home can be. So it was a lot of a lot of juicy stuff that we can talk about uh, to uh, help you essentially create a full rounded character and full rounded story. Yeah, I think you know, it's the same thing. Like I came up with the idea and I sent it to you and I was like, and I briefly jotted it down um, in like the internal document we have for webinars. And then I also was like, how do I articulate these ideas to other people? Uh, something that feels very important to me when I'm writing and developing my characters. So thank you for articulating that so beautifully. Um, I was struggling. <laughs> so I, I thought it would be helpful. And, and after the uh, webinar, we're going to make available a PowerPoint that will outline all of these ideas so you can come back and reflect on them. And then, of course, this is being recorded. Um, so you can also look at the video again as you're going through the PowerPoint. And then what will be available in the PowerPoint is when we reference certain things in our book, um, we'll include the page numbers so that you can see kind of like the underlying um, the underlying strategies that we're using. That's what will be in the PowerPoint and what we'll talk about today. But then, of course, you want to see how that gets played out in the book as we're writing it, the execution of it. Like, how does that scene look when you take these things and you put them together? Um, so I thought it would be helpful, though, to kind of, when we think about home, we, we really do think about it as a physical structure. It's kind of like the way, the place our mind goes to when we say, like, oh, what is home to us? Or we think about our community, right? Like, where am I from? That's my home. Um, and we kind of think of our group sometimes. And that, that, that is more character driven. But I was trying to think about, like, how, why, as a physical structure, what do we look for home in a physical structure? And I came up with these. Uh, kind of subcategories, which I think are important, because then we, when we identify them, we can start to place those things within the characters, our character groups, and that can make them become home to other people and also a home for themselves. So we're looking for shelter and we're looking for safety from the elements. Um, we're looking for a place where we can where we can rest and kind of be quiet, where we don't have to be on all the time. Um, we're looking for a place where we can recharge, but in a way that feels authentic to ourselves. So. Uh, not everyone recharges the same. Like mm -hmm. I like to close my windows and my shades and put on my headphones and have a solo dance party. Um, and that's one of the ways that I keep home alive. Like Fabulous. Myself. Um, and then another thing that we, we use our homes for, if you look around, if you're in your, well, we're all kind of in our homes now. Um, so like we're in your home. Um, <laughs> if you look around, you're going to see things that you have accumulated over time, uh, your prized possessions. And mm -hmm. I think that that's something that we also put within ourselves. We carry deeply within ourselves, our memories, our histories. Um, and then we also carry that within other people. Other people carry fragments of our memories, our histories. And that's why when we get together with them, sometimes it's so nice to reminisce, right? Because mm -hmm. of the shared experience. Um, so Mia, any thoughts on that before we move on? Or no, I did want to say if if anyone has any questions uh, as we're speaking, then they can absolutely add it in the chat box, and we will answer them as we go along uh, in the conversation. Yeah. Um, so another thing that came to mind was that it's not like we ourselves or our characters don't have a starting point, don't have a starting home, both internally and externally. Um, and so, really, the idea of home is not like it's an it's an end point, right? Mm -hmm. There will be the starting point of the home within the, the novel and where we leave the characters off at the end. And the homes will transform along the way. Yeah. So it's really, it's a journey, right? And so we're going to break this talk into two parts. Um, we're going to talk about the homes within ourselves, as Mia's mentioned, and, and also mentioned the homes that we create within the world of writing and the world that, that writing entails, the publishing world. Yeah. Um, so that's the talk structure. But first, we're going to talk about our characters. And we're going to begin with something that you can use to create um, tension. We're going to talk about opportunities to create tension, conflict, and transformative resolutions. Resolutions being the title of me. So, the resolutions. <laughs> um, so we're going to talk about the starting off with a, the imperfect home. Putting your character in a place where the home is fragile, where the foundation has cracks, because if there's cracks, then we can, we can break it apart and then rebuild it, right? Um, so I thought um, you were gonna do like a pause, like Dora the Explorer, like what's the word that we're <laughs> looking for? <laughs> Mia, can you give me that word? Um, but I know that within your book, the resolutions, that there are 
crux and the foundation at the start. And can you talk a little bit about that, Mia? Absolutely. Um, so the resolutions follows four characters and they sort of, um, uh, when I was creating them, I wanted them to have thinking of home, like multiple avenues uh, for them to essentially, um, uh, when you were talking earlier about what home allows us to be, um, I wanted to say home allows us to be messy when we found a home that actually is, um, that values us uh, all like, all the the bits and bobs. Um, home allows us to be weak and allows us to be messy and allows us to mess up. Um, so I have uh, four characters and they're all sort of, because they have such a strong friendship with each other and a strong sort of foundation in their relationship, I felt um, maybe this is a writer thing where we like to torture our characters, but um, I, I tortured them, but because I knew their foundation was strong, because I knew that there was always somewhere for them to go back to. Um, for example, Lee's home, Lee's foundation is um, her friends and her family. And uh, a lot of her journey is uh, coming to terms with the fact that her history, her moments of her home come with uh, uh, a genetic disease that she may or may not have. So that is a bit of her, that is either, either part of her foundation, whether she has it or not. Um, Nora is, is, um, uh, freaking cinnamon roll. Um, and she is coming to, <laughs> she's coming to terms that, that she, as much as she loves this home, this home that she has made with her mother, this, um, this restaurant, this love for baking, that there is something not quite there, uh, that is fully 100 for her in her, in her, in her home. Right. She's she's she wants to be happy in it, but there's there is something missing um, so that her her journey is toward to figure out how she she cannot make some essentially I'm going to flub a little bit as I as I find my words. Yeah. Um, a lot of Nora's journey is making someone else's home perfect for them, but avoiding her own uh, her own vision of home for herself. Um, like, do I follow my own dream? And by doing that, I'm putting cracks in the home that my mother has created for herself and that I am part of. Um, Cause she, uh, she loves that. She loves her mother and she loves what they've created, but it's not quite the, the place where she can be as vulnerable as she needs to be. So it's not quite home yet for her. Yeah, she's, she's, she's basically faced with the choice of living into the dream of her mother's home mm -hmm. versus exploring the possibilities of what a home constructed by herself organically could look like. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that the common, uh, separately from that, I think a common theme in both of our novels is the complications when you're creating your home, especially as a, as a teenager or as a young person. And part of that does often mean uh, maybe rejecting or modifying the construction of home as your parents have defined it yes. for you. Yeah, because yes. I see that in Marco's journey too. Um, so Marco has a lot, at the beginning of the novel, Marco has a lot of good things that they are good on the surface, right? He's got this scholarship to this university, and he's excited about that. He's got a girlfriend that he gets along with really well. They have fun. Um, he has you know, a good group of friends that always have his back, and he has two loving parents. Um, but within that, that exterior, there's also these cracks, right? Like there's the pressure that he feels to financially support his family because his father cannot work. Um, and there's a lot of medical debt from his father's injury. Um, there's the pressure that he feels to his relationship in your senior year, you're starting to make decisions if you've been in a romantic relationship, of like where is this gonna go? And he and his girlfriend are not necessarily on the same page about that. Um, and then there's the, um, there's a there's a complications uh, that come in, and and I think one thing you said was like there's this underlying guilt of like taking what is working well enough and then breaking that apart. Because I think for both of us, at the start of our novels, our characters are in situations that are not perfect, but they're manageable, right? Mm -hmm. They like they can make it work. It, it is at it is at the cost of stress or like 
suppressing the way that they feel, like a lot mm -hmm. of suppression of how they truly feel to keep going day by day, but the situations are manageable. And that, that takes us to the next part, which I think you can use to kind of create more tension and amp it up and lead to that truly climatic moment, which is because it is a spot that's manageable, our characters are often resistant to the change, right? Like, and that's something that we do. We make them resistant to the change to create this tension. And so the way that we can force them into the change, like you said, cause them harm, torture them, is put in- In a nice way. In a nice yeah. way. <laughs> create disruptions of home. We can start with their creating disruptions of their internal sense of home, and then also creating disruptions in the homes that they've created with the people around them. So with that in mind, could you talk a little bit about how you, like, what were your disruptors? What did you throw in some of your characters' ways to disrupt this manageable but not perfect situation? Um, excellent question. Oh, can, I can't know if you can hear the dogs right behind me. Um, oh, but as ambiance sounds, um, uh, when you were talking, I was thinking of the, you know, the meme of the little cartoon character drinking his coffee and there's just like flames all around him and he says, this is time. Um, and <laughs> Yeah. That made as you were talking about that made me think of, of Jess a lot in the resolutions. Jess, um uh when I think of Jess and her idea of home, it very much is like a frozen moment in time that she has guarded guarded very well in her memories, in her in her history, that is all of her all four of them together un like unmoving. Um and her her disruption, her stress is the possibility of a future without these people who are a foundation for her. Um, so she sort of disrupts and stresses her 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 home herself by putting too much pressure on those memories, on those foundations, um, on those blocks. Um, and and it spikes her and there's a lot of talk of anxiety and panic attacks because of Jess mm -hmm. uh, in Jess's chapters. Um, and essentially, it's it's. I almost feel like she, her 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 um, warping of of home is by trying to keep it from changing, trying to keep it from growing, um, and that sort of disrupts it naturally. As you you are not allowing something to naturally grow and change and do what it needs to do. Um, I'm trying to think also like of Ryan and the way that he at his vision of home and his major disruption is the foundation of his first love mm -hmm. um, and his breakup then sort of shatters, um, shatters what he thought was a well-built, um, well-built reality for him. So his journey is trying to figure out what that new reality is. And he, if he can build, if he can live with the scars that has uh, come about because of that first love and her first heartbreak. Um, and he, if he can live in that home that it has now created uh, in that new reality for him. Right. And what that reveals for him in terms of his, and it is like, like a lot of, I think Brian's journey, like that I appreciated was as he strives to learn how to handle, um, you know, kind of recovering from putting mm -hmm. yourself out there and being truly vulnerable to another human being and not having that work out the way that you had hoped it would work out. Yeah, you've invited that person into your home and you thought that you had made something together and then they're just like, peace out. Um, yeah. And they've left like their shoes behind and something. I some <laughs> <laughs> and they take with them that shared journey, those memories. It's like nobody understands those things more than the two people that were in it together. I mean, mm -hmm. you can tell it to your friends and you can, you can tell it even to yourself, but it's not the same as when the two people are in the room re-experiencing it together. Yes. I really appreciated those two threads in your novel because in my senior year, I just remember that my anxiety was so elevated that year. And I think it was for multiple reasons, but I never considered the idea that I was at the end of a journey and that coming to the end of a journey, you kind of build your way up in high school, right? Like you build your mm -hmm. way up, like knowing all the parts, you know, all your teachers, you got a good network of friends like I mean hopefully at that point you've got your rhythm um and then all of that is just like nope it's done start over again um so my anxiety was truly like amped up and and yeah and relationships romantic relationships certainly could escalate that so for Marco I mentioned this before but like the disruptors that I threw at him was you know um his father's traumatic brain injury which mm -hmm. is is there it's 
present and it's kind of background until a little bit uh, in the first third of the book and then it kind of amps up. Like there's things that come into play because of that injury that really throws into question the situation of like, can I leave? Can I leave my family and go away to college? And like things have finally stabilized where Marco was feeling like it was a stretch to go away, but it was possible. And then the injury comes back and creates new uh, implications for him and his family. And that throws his whole future into question. And then of course there's his first love returning. Um, and then there's uh, the competition that he ends up with Diego, his best friend, uh, which is kind of later in the book. Um, but what I wanted to point out about this was, so we've created this, this imperfection and these disruptions. And what we're doing as, in, in terms of a craft perspective is we're nudging our characters towards a redefinition of home, right? Mm -hmm. So like they're really like by the time that we, we take everything and we turn it upside down and we like let the internal home unravel, which is kind of the climatic moments in everyone's journey, um, our characters are coming, they come to a realization, right? They come to a realization that like what they thought was sustainable is clearly not sustainable. Mm -hmm. And also that the only way to build a new home is to one, come to terms with what you want at this point in your life. And then uh, be brave enough and authentic enough to share that with the world, right? Um, but I do think that this um, this creates a series of confrontations, right? Like our characters have to start confronting these questions. Maybe Ryan's confronting, like, who am I without this person, right? Mm -hmm. Who can I be without this person isn't in my life? Or um, who can I be? Would you agree with that or disagree? No. Yes, absolutely. Also, as 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 you were also speaking, it also made me think of if we've done enough of a good job creating a home, creating, building this structure for them, like any home, you don't always know what's in it. Like I challenge you to tell me what's in that closet you haven't looked at for three years. Um, uh, so there are things there that if you've done enough of a good job, uh, uh, you can pull out for your character, your character and be like, you know what? I was always that person. I was, I always had that thing. Um, uh, for Ryan, it's like his grandmother consistently reminding him of, of um, you, who you are is there, right? You just have to like clean out the clutter. You have to be okay with the, with the pieces that are broken and you have to, you have to just sort of um, just move things around a bit. Like you've all, like home is there. It might not, you might not be able to see it at first. And a lot of, of journeys is, is cleaning out that clutter, doing a spring cleaning um, and emphasizing certain things more than they were emphasized before. Um, yeah, I, I, love think, that, yeah. I think that for, for Ryan, it was cause I mean, his grandmother tells him, and I was like, you're there. You just, you just can't see it right now. <laughs> Uh, Cause all of this like dust and dust bunnies of heartbreak are like roaming around. Um, and eventually you'll, you'll be able to see what you want to see. Yeah. And I think this leads us into the next part, which is home. The home that we build in other people or characters that built in other people mm -hmm. are the things that pretty much rescue them or bring them to those moments of awareness, the aha that like something needs, to change and I need to embrace this newer version of me and just kind of bring it out into the world, right? And I think that's the mentor. So in our books, there's a series of, there's mentors, right? The grandmother is a mentor figure. Um, there's um, also categorized in your family. Then there's the friendships, right? Like even though your characters are all going through their own aha mm -hmm. moments, they're kind of doing it not simultaneously. Mm -hmm. There's like a, there's like a, like a, like a taking turns almost. So like when one person is struggling, the others can be there, or at least one of the others can be there to help them through. And they have that support. Um, and I think what, what I want to talk about here is that, like you said, if you've done your job, you've created a space where the characters can go to be vulnerable mm -hmm. um, and to be um, and where there's and their vulnerability can happen there because there there's established trust mm -hmm. and there's been a demonstration and this is something you can show in the earlier chapters as you're building up to this moment where they're going to have that aha moment where where the characters have come to each other and been messy and it's been okay they haven't been rejected for their imperfections mm -hmm. if anything they've been further loved and embraced it doesn't mean that the characters aren't honest with each other. 
but there's not this like condemnation of like, why don't you have it together? Again. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yes. Yes. But can you talk about that, how that plays out in your book a little bit? Um, yeah, I think, oh gosh, I think like with every, anything, uh, we are, uh, if if we look, for example, at, at Jess, Jess's biggest roadblock is herself. Um, she is consistently sort of un unwilling to to Jess is that sort of person that she is the sort of the mother of the group. She is used to being caring of everybody else and is unusual unused to having other people care about her uh, or caring towards her. Which is not that not that she has not gotten it, but it's not like her default. Um, uh, default sort of nature. Um, so I think for, for it, it feels, uh, like we're talking about just because it's, she is sort of like that person who doesn't want to acknowledge that things are breaking a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, uh, that there's that voice, that voice of anxiety, that voice that, that continues to, hmm, like rambling. (laughs) Um, but yeah, I think I'll have to was come back to There's a moment when Jess is really there for someone else despite, because I know that like there's moments in the book where Jess is really experiencing her own acute levels of anxiety and simultaneously she is trying to keep it together for the people that really mm-hmm. need her. Yeah, I think in her head, she sees the value of home as she is an acting figure in someone else's uh, creation of home. Like, um, uh, well, I can't, I can't fall apart because Ryan needs me. Mm-hmm. Right. But she doesn't have that question of, uh, well, B- Ryan would obviously come to my rescue if, if, uh... if I was also having that issue. So it's sort of like that, um, that, that she is a helper to a fault. Uh, in in her character and then that's sort of her weakness as well because she doesn't see when she needs the she needs someone to come in and help her clean up the cobwebs and and uh, get her get her foundation back to to a healthy place so in one way jeff is focused so much on being a safe home for everyone else around her that she has she's like ignored yes she's like ignored her own, her own. Home. yeah yeah oh yeah um in the universal laws of Marco, I feel like Suki's a bit of a of a mm-hmm. Jess, which also one mm-hmm. of her challenges is like letting go of her of this group that they put together and that feels really safe for her. Um, so yeah, I I can relate to the importance of having characters like that within the context of the book. It adds another element that you can explore about. Um, characters who are very good at giving to others, but maybe not necessarily good at receiving. And then that can be their journey of allowing uh, to receive from the characters around them. One of the, um, for, for Marco, one of the, the, the characters that was really transformative in terms of being an external home, and um, well, two stick out, but one was his relationship with his mentor, old Mrs. B. It's like those, like, I mean, like, he says, like, nobody knows how old Mrs. B is. <laughs> like, they're just, he puts her somewhere between, like, 1915. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, who knows? Like, maybe 1940 in terms of her year of birth. <laughs> like, and you just 19, don't even ask. 1915 is pretty old, y'all. Yeah. It's like, and, like, there's a certain level of ridiculousness about that observation. Um, but more so, he's just, like, she's just, like, this timeless figure for the neighborhood. And she is, of course, like, with all her wisdom, her job is that she's a librarian. Mm-hmm. you know and um throughout the book various characters go to her for support and for mentorship and because one of the reasons why as a writer i wanted to include old mrs b or that character in the book was because the family life that marco's dealing with is so complex it's not that his parents don't want to support him or not that they're not supportive mm-hmm. but it was acknowledging that within his home he would be unwilling much like jeff he would be unwilling to burden his family with his needs. And the value of placing an older, wiser character into the mix is that um, old Mrs. B has seen it all, right? She's been through so much in her life and she's also like lost the love of her life, um, old Mr. B. And um, 
And so when Marco comes to her to have these very kind of benign interactions where he's not really trying to reveal anything, but just help her out because he feels a sense of responsibility. Again, he wants to take care of someone. Um, she is able to kind of lead him into these conversations where she can poke holes in his logic and very astutely say, I think you should rethink that. And those little seeds are planted all throughout the novel um, so that as other things come up, Marco can circle back to old Mrs. B in his head saying like, mm, is that really true? Like, do you really not have feelings for this other girl? Like, why, you know, why are you holding off on this relationship with the first girl? Like, how do these things connect? And so as a writer, the value of having these older characters with more life experience can be really important, wouldn't you say? Like the grandmother mm -hmm. figure for Ryan. Absolutely. Um, I wish I had that, that, that uh, not that I haven't had that figure, but um, that uh, I feel like creating that consistency um, is such a gift in for my characters that I just as as, as much as I'd like to torture them, I also want to make sure that they're heading in the right direction uh, as well. Um, and also made me think of of, of um, when we when we're most of the times when we're talking about home, we think of of maybe like setting in a novel like uh, like world building in a way, but you're all, but we're what we're really talking about is world building of a character. Right. It's not this. It's, it's as much as it is about the city that they live in. It, it's more about what are the pretties, the pretty things and the ugly things that always hover around this character. Right. Your character is kind of like mm. the sun. What are the planets that are hovering around it? Yeah. Right. Like if if um, what is the constant level of truth that is always coming at your character that is calling it on its BS? Um, what's the what's this? What's the the crack in the in the street that is always coming up every time uh, they're going on a journey or they're going in a in a in a in a in a direction like what is hovering constantly around them either emotionally or or physically um, it's like it is pain coming around at this hour is it is it tragedy is it is it humor how are they revolving around them at any particular time um, essentially how are you creating a an ecosystem that is made of emotion as much as it's made of plot and things that move things forward, move things forward in an action way. Cause really emotion can also move things forward, right? Right. Someone doesn't need to drop a, a, a magic mirror in front of you <laughs> to move <laughs> forward. Um, it can be emotionally based uh, as well. And plot can be as much about feeling as it is about, I need to go to the grocery store. And when I get there, there is no more bread or something. <laughs> Yeah, I love what you said about it's an ecosystem because mm -hmm. one of the things that I think that happens within an ecosystem is that physically people who live within the ecosystem, um, I mean, if we if you take care of the ecosystem, I guess, but physically the, the home may get destroyed, but the ecosystem with which the home exists, it is sustainable. It yeah. is self-sustainable. And because it's self-sustainable, that is always a foundation that is available um, to the inhabitants of that ecosystem. So I think that really expresses well what we're trying to do when we create these really diverse and interconnected characters that are moving around, as you said. So I'm looking at the chat. Let's stop, because we're going to transition um, into the writing publishing conversation, <laughs> which I have told Mia goes, she gets to leave. <laughs> um, um, but first, let's look at our polls. So I'm clicking okay. on polls. Um, so young we adult. have young adult is really represented here, 77%. Um, we have middle grade uh, and avid readers of the next category uh, with 11%. And then just under percent each is um, those writing adult and picture books. So thank you all for joining. I think this can be applied to any any spectrum, whether you're writing young adult, middle adult, or even just like the way that you're looking at books as a reader. Um, I think this can be really applied, uh, this lens can be applied to any of those perspectives. And now let's look at the chat. Do you wanna read through some of that uh, chat? We've got some shout outs. 
We do. I think we're I think we're mostly just like people commenting. We don't have any questions yet. Um, but if you have any questions about how to build your ecosystem for your character, uh, please let us know. Um, I know it's a hard thing that sort of uh, takes a while to build out, sort of like you're growing a garden. Um, but we're happy to share any 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 hints. Um, not hints. What is it? Tips. Yes. Thank you. Strategies. Um, things that have worked for us in the past. Noni says uh, that home is what rescue you rescues you, and she likes that home is an accumulation of memory and history. Hi, yeah. Noni. Hi, Noni. Um, and we've got people uh, watching from all over the place, so that's nice to see too. So, we all right. everybody class. Yes, that's live. Okay. So um, let's talk about home as let's talk about home from the for, as writers as ourselves now. Let's bring this into. Um, There's so, questions. Are there critical ingredients to creating that home? To that home as writers, I think it's maybe that that's the concept. Sheila, as you mean in your story for your characters, or uh, home as writers for publishing? I'm gonna wait a moment in case um, you can clarify. Uh, okay. But yes, if we want to talk uh, finding a home in publishing, which uh, what is that even? Okay, because um, we're the characters. So the let's, character. talk, let's go back to that real quick. Um, hmm, creating that home. I, I think going back to the, and this will be in the PowerPoint that we put up, I think kind of addressing, um, and, and depending on how you want that home to look, because if you're trying to create an imperfect home, then I think, so for the point of like, starting the events off, right, creating a, a catalyst for change, then the critical ingredient uh, would be to put flaws in the home that need to be addressed. I'm more, I mean, it depends on your book. With 34, like, I just started off with, like, I took a hammer to the home. <laughs> like, there was, there was, the flaws were so obvious. Like, it was not like, it was not like there was like any question that the home needed to be built from the bottom up. Um, but with, because 34 was so hard to write emotionally, I was like, I need something light. So I decided in the new, that my critical ingredient for the new uh, book would be creating a home where there was enough cracks that as a writer, it would allow me to get in and then from those cracks create like the logical disruptions. Um, if, we're, if we're talking about like what we want our characters to find within each other, then I think using that kind of analogy, like what we look for in a physical home, we can go through our characters and be like, does this character provide this to another character in their emotional home? Is it a place like where they can provide shelter and safety? So one thing Mia said was the way that actually looks, the shelter that they provide is that the character can be messy. Mm -hmm. The character messy can come and vulnerable. in. Vulnerable. Yeah, and vulnerable. And so um, can they provide uh, moments of recharge? So. I think one of the things that uh, Mia's book starts off with in the beginning is that they are in a moment of recharge, right? They're all hanging out. They're all like, I think it's like watching a movie or they're about to do a movie marathon. Mm -hmm. um, and so really putting that down on the, the page, how they refresh each other, how they re serve as points of recharge. Um, and, and, and in a way that feels authentic to who they are as, as people, not just generic, but really finding like that character's particular way of recharging. One thing that really for um, Marco made uh, his relationship with Sally stand out versus his relationship with Erica, the two girls that he's kind of wavering between, uh, which I put a lot on the page, is that when he's with Erica, they talk about a lot of things that are on a superficial level. They're fun, they're light. But when he's with Sally, they talk about things that they both find fascinating, which are more about like the universe and curiosity. And so as you get to like see like what could these two homes offer him, one allows him to recharge and refresh, but another one allows him to slip into the quiet part of himself that just wants to be with someone else in a way that feels very comfortable to him. It almost feels like being with himself. Um, and so that is something that um, that you can do. And another thing is you can look at your characters and be like, what parts of history are they holding together for each other? And are those histories resolved? Because sometimes you can create tension 
I have them carrying each other's history, this like shared memory and that not being resolved. And that can be a good space to dig in and, and really start looking at things. Okay, thank you for the question, Sheila. Um, so- Can I say one thing before we go? Yeah, so home um, a- uh, about about ingredients. Um, when one of my favorite things of uh, doing when I was when I was uh, doing uh, writing the resolutions and the way I found essentially each of the characters that I was writing is to write the nonsense, um, mm-hmm. to write the 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 moments where there is no plot happening that um, nothing needed to move forward that they were just being teenagers talking about just the stupidest things or reminding themselves of that time that they did that silly thing and then the other friend will never forget it. And sort of just like um, the, in the book, it was the, it was the text messages that they would just, the text messages that that went on for years and years. Um, That was my, my key into finding my characters was how they essentially uh, uh, interacted with each other when there was nothing important happening, right? that that vulnerability that like making fun of each other but also being there for each other um like what how we how we breathe with each other when we are together was how i sort of built them as characters and built them as a home yeah I really, um, well, one, I think I texted you at one point to tell you that their text messaging was cracking me up. <laughs> when I was reading, I was like, I was like, texting, I'm like, this is cracking me up. Um, one of the other things that I recall about your book that I really appreciated was that they started to share their collective longing for things. Yes. So they were really invested in like Ryan returning to his passion of, well, his painting. They were his right. art. Whatever that looked like, his, him being a creator, they knew that that was important, and they kind of collectively longed for him to move in that mm-hmm. direction. And then I can't remember was it was it Nora who had a collect a longing to go to the ocean? Yeah, she had a she had a she wanted to travel and she wanted to to explore more. Um, it's funny because now I can't remember if I it ended up in the final book or not, but she had the recurring dream of traveling to Puerto Rico and I can't remember if it's actually in the book anymore. Um, as as you might know with all the all the rewrites, sometimes I, I can't yeah. remember if something ended up in the chopping block or not. Um, but yeah, that's sort of um, the, when you know your fellow uh, people in your home and your family in your in your in your ecosystem that you are aware of when they are um, not being true to themselves uh, in a way. That's that also is one, what I wanted to create in the the catalyst at the beginning is of the resolutions themselves is sort of them calling them, them calling themselves out uh, on when they're not being authentic anymore. Yeah. Um, they're like, you, you're, you're no longer doing this thing that used to bring you so much joy. So we're gonna, we're gonna put it as a resolution for you and see what happens. And, um, doesn't doesn't always turn out super well, but that's the that's the whole point. Yeah, and I think that's a good thing to remember that like the most stable homes, they end in an in a place that's filled with authentic authenticity and truth, right? Mm-hmm. So you kind of have your character starting off where they're like these things are not authentic, and then you leave them in a place where it's much more authentic and filled with truth, which is beautiful. All right, so shall okay, we publishing. On? Well, I want to separate these two things out because I want to say that there's creating your home as a writer Mm -hmm. and then your home within a community of fellow writers or creators. Um, And then, and then you take that and then you go into the world of publishing. Yes. (laughs) Yes. The world of writing and the world of publishing are very different things. Um, So let's talk about the internal world. Like the first, uh, your I feel like we could we could kind of scaffold this as like we can talk about how do we create. um, I'm going to go back to this question: Are there critical ingredients to creating that home as a writer within ourselves, or what have you found to be critical to your to To my home as a writer? Yeah, to taking care of yourself as a writer. Um. I think Lori Hell Sanderson says this all the time, and it's like you have to be you have to be protective of your time as an artist. 
um, no matter uh, no matter what that may look like on the outside. Um, uh, in terms of, of I have an hour a day to write and that is my hour to write um, and that belongs to me. Um, which which I have yet to 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 master, to be honest. Um, but being protected of your as your time as writers, because uh, I don't know, I don't know if for anybody out there, I tend to overstretch myself, like helping people out, like oh, I want to see this person, oh, I want to do this, oh, I want to do that. I mean now, um, uh, I mean even now, let's be honest, I haven't been able to do any writing uh, during this time. I don't know if anybody else out there has been able to do any writing. Uh, but let us know in the chat. Uh, <laughs> Give us your tips for that. <laughs> for um, doing writing during this time. But but yeah, I mean, I, I hope to eventually be more protective of my time as a writer, uh, so that I can I can healthily do uh, my my art. Um, and I also think community has been a very 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 centering and and recharging part of being a writer to be honest uh finding that community finding those people that you can um uh chat with and just be open with um, and it takes it takes a very long time to be honest it takes a very long time to find writers that you can um that you can connect with and also that you can be honest with as with any friendship um uh there are people that turn out to be not great friends uh uh, in the end and sort of hurt you along the way. Um, and there are people that, there are tears, right? Tears of friendship uh, in a way. Um, so finding that community takes trial and error uh, in, a lot of, um, in a lot of work. Yeah. I think the time component is so essential um, to the writing, right? Because you can't write if you don't kind of carve out that, that time. And and I think because so much of writing is self-driven, right, we're often not working under a deadline, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So when you're working under a deadline, it's a little bit, I think, easier to feel like this is vital, this is important, this is necessary. Someone is expecting something from me. But when we're not working under a deadline, it, it turns into, I, what am I expecting from myself? Exactly. And then, right. And then, and then also, like, a lot of times writing is actually not writing. It's thinking, right? Sometimes it's just like, like there's been times when I've had like neighbors catch me through the window, just kind of sitting on my bed and mobile, like staring off into space. And then I'll like turn and look and realize that, like they can see me doing this. And I'm like, and I was like, if I were to describe to them what I was doing sitting there for 15 minutes and mobile staring off into space, it would be something like I'm feeling, I'm having feelings, right? <laughs> How close were your neighbors? <laughs> well, it was like, when I lived in a studio that was in a house. But like, um, shout out to my neighbors and my love. Um, but so, but this idea of like, what does that look like from an outside? It, it doesn't look like you're doing anything, but you are actually doing something that's super important to your writing, which is you're letting your mind kind of wander in a broad way and feel things. And those things will eventually come out onto the page. But when you're sitting down to like put down your calendar and schedule that time out, like, you're like, oh, 30 minutes to just sit on the porch and stare off into space. It feels like if you're not actually physically getting things onto the page, that you're failing as a writer. Like you yes. are like- We are so hard on ourselves. <laughs> um, and, you, and you can't walk away from the day and be like, I wrote a thousand words. Like, you know, then like you feel I wrote like- five and then I deleted them. <laughs> exactly. There's no tangible outcome. You feel like it's not, it's not like a regular job where at the end of the day, you have all these things that you've done. I send out emails and all this other stuff, right? You can like kind of, you can count. Um, I think another thing for me is along that lines of protecting the time is protecting my curiosity. So, mm -hmm. and what I mean by that is like, oftentimes once you get, so when you first start off as a writer, you really are just driven by, I mean, at least I was, I was just driven by my curiosity. When you take that into the world of publishing, right? And you start to deal with, the world of, you know, your agents whom mm -hmm. love you and your, um, you know, your editors and, and like the idea of like taking my art and then I'm going to make it, um, I'm going to make it turn into income, right? Mm -hmm. You may be inclined to not follow 
your interests fully, something that is really calling to you as a creative person to explore and to put on the page. You may look at that and say, and talk about it with your agent, or you may talk about it broadly with somebody in publishing, and you may hear that there's no space for that in the world. Um, and I think that what I've learned is that the most important thing for me to keep regenerating as a writer is to follow my curiosity and not necessarily let it be guided by what is currently in the market. I mean, if it aligns mm -hmm. with that, great. But if it doesn't, having the authenticity to say, but this is what I want to explore right now. This is where I want to be right now. Right. And when I do that, I feel more in touch with my voice. Mm -hmm. And that makes it easier for things to get on the page. Yeah. So what do you, how do you feel about that? Absolutely. And I think I was, I was, um, in Maida did an, an interview with her editor earlier in the in the week, and I uh, disclosure I used to work in publishing, uh, so whenever I and whenever um, you absolutely have to just go with your curiosity. But by the time that someone identifies a trend, the trend is either over or like on its last legs, uh, yeah. right? Um, like it takes a, let's say like if you're really fast six months for you to write the first draft of your book or um, and then there's editing and then they have to sell it and then it goes to your editor and then there's more editing. Um, but like, so if you're writing something to follow a trend, by the time you get there, the, the trend is over. Um, the trend has moved on. So unless you're like write something that you are passionate about um, because publishing is not nice. Publishing also does not make sense. I'll tell you that right now. Um, if some, half the time when people ask me for publishing advice, I end up like giving two completely opposite advice things like, well, you should do this, but also it doesn't mean anything. And also, but this, but if you do this advertising, it will lead to no sales because we haven't really been able to track that. Um, yeah. So it's publishing is just like, I don't even know. Um, uh, my friend Colleen, who also worked in publishing, is on here. So Colleen, I don't know, Colleen, if you can if you can verify whether or not I'm I'm talking out of my booty. Um, but publishing is just like, even I feel like even if you work in publishing, we're just like we're just going to do this, and if it works, that's great. We'll keep doing that, and if it doesn't, we don't know. Like, <laughs> yeah, and everything is such really, a guessing game. Yeah, that's like really. Uh, yeah, I'm already saying it's a mystical thing. It's the mystical thing, publishing. <laughs> well put. Um, I think that, um, and that's why kind of going back to the root of who you are as a writer, right? And making that the priority. So I guess the question is, like, I think at, at a certain point as a writer, I had to ask this question, which was, is my end goal to keep writing and have this thing for myself? which brings me so much joy and sometimes can be, um, I'm reading what Colleen, Colleen wrote, and can sometimes be, <laughs> and can sometimes be um, uh, what's the word, like turned into a monetary gain, mm -hmm. or is my end goal to be someone who's, you know, published? And I think like um. those things, like I think obviously when I was in publish, I was like, yeah, my end goal is to get published. You know, that's my goal, my goal, my goal. And now that I'm published, I'm like, my end goal is just to, like, be a writer for the rest of my life. And, like, publishing will be its own. Because the pub cause publishing is just that first step, right? You don't want a book out there. You want many books out there. You want to have a career. Um, yeah. uh, but you also want to be, hopefully, achieving that in the healthiest way possible, which I feel yeah. like sometimes the young adult and middle, uh, not maybe not the middle grade world as much, but the young adult world feels like it's such it's living in such a heightened uh, timeline uh, that I feel like it's very easy to get caught up in the machine of publishing that you uh, b forget the the love of it as a writer that you had in the beginning. Right. Um, so it's sort of finding that healthy that, balance. Yeah, if you don't protect it, if you don't keep that in balance, you basically are gonna burn out. Mm -hmm. And if you burn out, there is no, putting more books out into the world for a wide audience. You're you're burned out. You're discouraged. And I think so, yeah. So I think the answer to the question we're both coming up with is like it starts here. Burn like, it all down. No, I'm kidding. What? 
<laughs> and what I mean with Colleen said, Colleen said, publishing is a 19th century business trapped in a 21st century world, yeah. um, which is very <laughs> true. Publishing sort of is like consistently needing to catch up to their reader, uh, not just in what they want to read, but in terms of who they are. I mean, if you if you remember the the I don't have my postcard here, but the whole like uh year in children's publishing where they show you like this is how many people many books have white characters this is how many uh, yeah. books have uh african american characters native characters stuff like that um publishing is worse as the people who work there uh and i say that as someone who still um has a merry many wonderful people who work there and are doing uh amazing jobs in uh uh championing uh uh diverse voices uh it, publishing is still very, 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 very white. Like I, w I want to say, I think in the last, correct me if I'm wrong, people who actually have uh, a connection to the internet right now, I don't want to touch on anything in case webinar jam and gets angry at me. Um, I feel like 85% white uh, in, twen in 2019. And I think the year before it was 84%. So whoever left <laughs> literally shifted that 1% over. Um, in publishing, so it's still like very, very much. Uh, cat, I don't, I don't even want to say catching up because we lost a percent. So it's just like going backwards. Like what's going on? Um, and it's also still very much as, as Colleen said, living in the nineteenth century. Uh, still, almost all of it is in New York. Um, I know some. There are some areas not outside of New York. Um, still, uh, I mean, we'll see after after all of this if they they uh, embrace teleworking more uh, because that could absolutely widen the field of people that who, who can who can bring different points of view into publishing that can't necessarily afford a New York rent. Right, yes, yeah, New York is very expensive. I have um, very many thoughts of publishing. <laughs> Anarchy. There was, <laughs> there was something um, that I wanted to touch on then. So, so finding those those spaces where the where people within them, you know, look like you, right, or mm -hmm. or have similar experiences to you, um, or um, or just where you're with you're you're kind of moving into this diverse area of of voices, right? I think one thing that I think that's very ex not. Ex it's becoming increasingly accessible if you look for it and people are starting to build that. And I think, um, I think that that's where like we can talk, touch on about writing communities, right? Because that's mm -hmm. where like outside of the machine of publishing, like we have more agency in the communities that we build to fill these needs. So what are your thoughts on that? Can you repeat that for one more time? It had like a Sure. Fun. So like we, we don't necessarily at this point in time have that much agency in like, uh, the pu publishing industry, like our, our mm -hmm. relationship to the publishing agency, like we would you like only have to so much control, right? We would like to see things change, but we can't expedite that process as hard as we try. Or it's not on us, right? Yeah. As writers, yeah, right. So looking for a space where we have agency, like would that would be in the writing communities, right? And maybe mm -hmm. we can kind of close off with talking a little bit about the importance of building your community and finding like that to be like a stabilizing force, a foundation. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's that you essentially described why the Las Musas was formed. Um, um, the the initial group of of Musas, which I think was Aida, Emma, uh, um, Gladiver, Taylor, Jen, um, Hilda. Um, I'm gonna get. I'm gonna forget like a billion people um, who then invited me and invited a whole bunch of other people. Uh, their initial idea was to to have a community that we could back each other up as we're going up against publishing, which is just a big thing, um, and a lot of the times doesn't make sense and no end. There's so much being uh, put out there by publishing that it is very easy for Latinx voices to get lost in the fray. Um, uh, so that was one, one, one part of it to sort of like amplify our, our, our marketing voices as a power. Right. Um, and the other part was just finding a community that would back us up, 
uh, when we needed it, just someone to to speak to, someone to to maybe like find a critique partner that also shared your ethnic background that you could, uh, uh, if you had a question about like, um, uh, my my copy edits of the resolutions was me adding like links to yes this is in fact how you say it in in Caribbean Spanish uh, no that is not how you change it um, uh, because my copy editor was not Puerto Rican so she had many many questions about how things were said in the book um, and I've noticed recently that a lot of our questions in Las Musas is like hey my copy editor doesn't think that this is a word but this is how we use it in in X and X and someone was like well what's like, is that Mexican slang? Is that like um, Peruvian slang and stuff like that? And like how we can help each other out um, in these communities or just um, give each other the strength. A lot of uh, like, no, actually your editor uh, is not seeing that, yes, this is part of the Latinx culture or 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 you're absolutely right. You should go back and do this thing. Um, uh, and just just having that 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 home, that structure, that family, that that place to go back to and have these conversations is very important because publishing can sort of make you doubt yourself as an as a as an artist a lot, right? Why isn't my book not selling? Why didn't yeah. I get the publishing money? Why wasn't I put like why am not am I not like a uh, a lead title? What is it? Is this normal? What can I do? How can I um, how can I take control? Uh, what, what are the things that I can do for my art? that doesn't put it on uh, somebody else to do it for me. Right, and I, I think that's really well said. I, I don't even, I don't have really have anything to add to that, um, which is good because we are basically out of time. <laughs> <laughs> but if anybody has any questions about publishing, um, I think we can, we can go over a little bit if anybody has questions, but you can also find us um, on, oh, and of course, like an idiot, I forgot to put, uh, our books there. So if you would like to uh, support us as authors and uh, buy our books, you can also go to our, we have uh, lasmusasbookshop.org. Um, if you don't want to support Amazon, uh, oh shoot, I'm not sure if I should have said that word. Uh, they'll find me now in a drone. Um, but we have a bookshop.org, which uh, supports your local indies during this time. And they are shipping uh, um, directly to your door. So you don't have to wait four months for, for a non-essential if you want a book right now and it supports your local indies. Um, and I am gonna put up a quick slide of where you can find us. Uh, so if you have questions about publishing or about writing or about creating your character's ecosystem, you can find us as well if my computer decides to actually do the thing. Yeah, see. And um, you can also, so I, Mia, is there going to be a way, will we have access to everyone's email address to register for this so I could send out yes. the PowerPoint? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, great. So Thank that you. will come in the future. Um, so look for that if you want to go through and look at our more specific notes and kind of how we structured this talk and some of the things that we touched upon. Okay. It's going to load. I don't think so. Um, and also doesn't let me stop it. So. Oh no. So this is all you're going to get to see from us. <laughs> Just the turning wheel for this eternity. Is this, this is our goodbye. This is our goodbye. <laughs> All right. Well, Mia, I it's been. This. I guess we should just. Should we just say goodbye, or should we wait this out? Um. Let's just probably say goodbye because I don't know if. Well, well, can you say out loud where they can find you? Yes. Uh, Carmen Rodriguez with an S dot com. And you, Mia. Yeah. Um, mgarciabooks dot com, and I am M Garcia writes across all social media. Um, as well. And so I'm seeing that we are actually what everyone is not good, the, not the screen, which is good because then you can, I, mean, I can't see you anymore, Mia, but I trust you both just as I remember you. So um, I want to thank everyone for attending this webinar and Mia for being my co pilot on this. Yay, this was such fun. And yes, please reach out to us if you have any more questions. Um, visit thebookshop.org if you want to support us as writers, because uh, that would be lovely. Also supporting your local independent bookstores because they're going through um, 
a rough time right now as we are all as well. And we will be following up with uh, a copy of this presentation via email. So hopefully we will get that to you soon. Sounds great. All right. All Have right. a lovely day. Bye. Bye.